lesson on really focusing and really noticing what we're doing and to have a singleness of mind. Now, it's really the thought I had when I was thinking about this lesson is having singleness of mind. If you ever notice when you want to accomplish something, you can't vary from it. And if you do, you won't do a really good job at it. So you have to have singleness of mind. And I want to read this morning a couple scriptures to really set the tone and set the seriousness for this. When we're talking about serving God, we have to be in singleness of mind. Everything else falls away. In Acts chapter 17, it's verse 30 beginning on this lesson. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, to totally turn from sin, to turn from the way that they had lived. In verse 31, Because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, in that He hath raised Him from the dead. And that's Christ. We think about how serious it is when we have things that round about us that tries to pull us away from serving God. Well, it's very eternally serious. And how that we have to have singleness of mind when we're serving God, we have to purpose, in other words, to serve God faithfully. It's not something that you can be haphazard about. You have to have purpose in your walk with Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, I'm going to turn there. And read verse 1 beginning. God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, who He hath, who he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He hath made the worlds. We see again how serious that is, how serious a matter it is to serve God faithfully and walk as Christ walked, being our pattern for life and eternity if we are faithful unto God. And that's the thing about it, being faithful. That's the thing about that comes to all of us that we have to make sure that we're doing is being faithful. And I'm going to turn over to Mark chapter 12. And if we don't have singleness of mind, you know, if our mind and our heart doesn't align, if our desires and our wants don't align, there's going to be a lot of problems for us. There always has been for mankind and there always will be. But Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, it says this, and I love reading this verse. I love reading this verse. I think about it quite a bit and how that you have to have everything aligned and you have to be in singleness of mind is how I like to word that. But in Mark chapter 12 verse 30, it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. With This is the first commandment. God doesn't accept second best, second place in anyone's life. You have to put God first in your life and everything you do. And when you do that, you will know how to treat other people, individuals, and how that you should interact. Because if we don't put God first, we're putting something else first. What is it? Well, people put money first, desires and pleasures this world first. They'll put all kinds of other things first. And when they do, it misaligns everything because God made us. He knows what's best for us. He knows how that we should act, how that we should interact. And He tells us exactly what we should do. And even to the extent, giving us a pattern and someone to look at. You think about that. He could have easily just told us what we should do. He could have easily just told us what to do. It's written down for us. We have the perfect example for us. So we have no excuse not to live that way. Not that we won't make mistakes as human beings. And God understands. He knows that we are going to be a people that at times we make mistakes. That's what grace is for. And He gives us that opportunity to come to Him in prayer. But we are not to be a people that are haphazard in that life. I'm going to go to read in Ephesians chapter 4. We're not to be a people that is haphazard with serving God. We are to be purposeful in our walk with Christ. Very much making sure He's at the forefront of everything we do, whether that's what we do when we're at work. So we're a Christian, of course, when we're at work, what we do at home with our family. We're a Christian then when we are with our friends. Christian then, there is no exclusion. There is no time like the world tries to think that you can... You can remove being Christian for a period of time and be like the world. There is no such thing. You're a Christian all the time. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 beginning, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in 
you all. One. That's why I want to read that scripture to show the oneness and how there is singleness and how that we are to be like that as well, that there would be no divisions, especially among us, that there be no divisions among us, that we are one in what we say and how we act and how we interact. You know, someone should not be able to point. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and read there in just a second. But someone should not be able to point to a brother and sister in Christ and say, you know, that person over there, I know that they're a thief or they're a murderer or they're going out on Saturday night and they're getting drunk all night. They shouldn't be able to do that. They should be able to look at us as Christians and say, I know that person, they are purposeful in their walk with Christ and they always point to Christ for their righteousness and they're going to be trying to work for Christ. Whatever they're doing, I know that individual, and whatever they're doing, they're trying to work for Christ. They should always be able to point to us and see the light of Christ, a life that is like Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. He's not the author of confusion. We see that in the world where people will write all kinds of different, and I'm not saying that all commentaries are bad when I say this, but we'll see all these different commentaries that will cause confusion. If something is against what God says, it's worthless. And again, not all commentaries are bad, but some intentionally try to sow strife. There's times when people will come into congregations and that is their purpose. They will try to sow strife. I was talking to a brother in Christ not long ago, and he was telling about that, how an individual come into the congregation, and that's what he done. He caused strife and caused a split in the congregation and caused a lot of problems, and it's very unfortunate. It's unfortunate when you see that, someone who purposefully tries to do that. And it's something we have to watch and be mindful of. We have to be purposeful in our walk with Christ, knowing that there are people that try to look the part, but they don't act the part. And they may even for a period of time try to pretend to be a Christian, try to pretend to do what's right, but they're not doing what's right. In John chapter 14, as the Scripture says, you'll know them by their fruits. You'll know them by what they're producing, in other words. But in John chapter 14, verse 6, it says this, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Sometimes people will come into congregations and try to, show, try to sow discord among the brethren, and they will try to tell you that there's multiple ways to the Father. That seems so foreign to me. I'm sure it does to you too. That someone would even try to think that, except we hear that out in the world, but people may try to do that. Why? Because they're trying to circumvent the teachings of Christ. They're trying to be antichrist. Whether they know it or not, that's exactly what they're doing because when we say something that varies from what God says, when we say something opposite of what Christ says, we are being an antichrist. You're being in opposition to Christ. There's many times we can read about the Scriptures when Christ was here. There's many individuals that done that. And we can read many places where we see the people that were supposed to be the religious leaders of the time that were saying the opposite of what Christ was saying. They were trying their best to be against what He was saying, trying their best to stop what He was saying. And we can see that those people that were around about Christ tried to sow discord among them. In John chapter 10, I want to read starting at verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catches them, and scattereth them scattereth the sheep. There's a lot in that. Nonetheless, we see that Christ is that true shepherd. He's the one we turn to. He is the door. He is the way. Every other way, let it fall to the side and we should not pay attention to it because it will sow discord and we won't be in singleness. We won't be able to work in a manner which is pleasing to God if there is divisions among us because those problems will cause strife. So we have to make sure that we watch that to make sure that those things which people try to sow round about us does not grow. In Matthew chapter 6, in verse 24, it says this, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise, and despise the other. He cannot serve God in Maimon, showing that singleness that we have to, and people do pick a side. I was going to say you have to pick a side. People pick a side whether they realize it or not that they cannot serve two masters. There's people in this world, they'll say, well, I'm a Christian, but 
And that's a terrible thing for to hear someone say, I'm a Christian, but I enjoy these things. Well, those things are hindering you in your walk with Christ. There cannot be two masters. There's only one. You have to pick. And people, again, whether they do so actively or inactively, are making that choice in who they're going to serve. Case in point, if someone says, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to do anything. I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to read the Scriptures. I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to actively try to seek and save the lost. Well, by fiat of the fact that someone's not making an active decision, they're still making a decision not to serve God faithfully. See, no matter what we do, we're making a decision, and we have to be in singleness of mind and service to God, and that's the only way that we will be pleasing to God. It is impossible for us to please God and try to be like the world. It is not possible. It cannot be. It will not be. There is no way to be like Christ and be like the world. They are complete polar opposites and cannot mix. It is carnal and spiritual. Those things cannot come together. And Jeremiah chapter 32 is where I want to turn to and read. Jeremiah 32 in verse 37, beginning. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whether I have driven them in my anger and in my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them, thinking about how we have to be in singleness of mind, how their heart and our mind must align. I've said this many times in the past, at different times, different places, I appreciate that, is how that your heart and your mind have to align. Well, when I say that, a lot of times people, they'll have a little bit of confusion about that. And here's another way I can point this out. Your heart, your desire, and your logic have to be one. Your desire to serve God and the knowledge of how you're serving Him have to align. If I have a desire to serve God, I have the Scriptures available. Yet if I do not have a desire to serve God, then I won't even pick up the Word of God and read it. And it is vital for us to do that. If we go over to James chapter 1, starting at verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think. Now this is so sobering. When I finally grasp this, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if you waver, if you're double-minded, if you're not singleness, if you don't have a singleness of mind and service to God and that faith, then you're not going to receive anything of Him. You shouldn't expect to receive anything because you are double-minded. You're still trying to be like the world and still trying to serve God. You cannot do those things. Those things will not mix. Someone who doesn't have faith in God, it's just like if you had, and I've thought about this a lot, how that we can equate a lot of how we are before God to little children and how that we expect them to listen to what we say. And if you tell your child something and they don't believe you, you pause for a second, you wonder, why didn't, they, why didn't that child believe me? Well, you think about how God tells us these things and He expects us to believe it, and we should, yet if we are wavering to and fro whether or not we're going to obey and believe what He says, why would we expect to receive anything from Him? We are like a wave. We're still double-minded. And that's where Satan can sow his seed, by the way. See, if we're double-minded in our service to God, if we're not singleness, single in our mind and service to God, Satan can come in and sow a seed in there and plant doubt. That's the enemy of faith is doubt. That's what he will do is plant a seed of doubt. And we have to watch that. We have to be careful about that because that's what he wants is just a, just a crack. I mean, just a little bit. Just wants a small place to plant something and to disrupt a Christian's walk. When we were born in this life, God knew what purpose we had in service to Him. Who we're going to be around, how we're going to act around them. He knew when we were born what purpose He had for us right then. And when we don't follow God faithfully, we disrupt that walk with God.
And he knew what, what kind of actions that we could have in service to him right then. And we make that choice whether we're going to be walking in doubt or in faith. And in faith, we have that shield of faith where we can stop those seeds and those fiery darts. We can stop those seeds from being planted where it would disrupt our walk with Christ and our service to God. And we'll never know. You know, here's the most concerning thing, and I've thought about this, about the people that I interact with. Uh, people I've worked with in the past for decades now, I've worked with in the past, and how many of them did I fall short of talking to as I should have that God would have wanted me to talk to them? How many people? Well, I don't know. And I hope I've done enough that someone's seen Christ in me that they would open their Bibles and read it. And I want them to turn to Christ. I want them to obey what He says. But if we let Satan plant seeds of doubt, then we will stop. And there's a lot of impact. And I know a lot of times we think about the individual right then, but there's generational impacts on people when you talk to them about Scripture, how that they carry what you say to others. Think about that. It's not just the person you talk to. How often do you hear somebody say something and they repeat what somebody else said? They do the same thing with the Scriptures. They'll say, well, brother or sister so-and-so said this to me. What kind of impact does that have on the person they spoke to? Or the next person, the next person? We don't know. I don't always know. You don't always know. But we certainly hope that it grows. We certainly hope that people hear what God says and obey it. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, I want to start there for just a second. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and all and had all things common. When I think about this, I think about how that we look at the early church. We look at those individuals that were there earlier and much before us, how that they had all things in common. We read about that here and how that we should as well, how that we should be in oneness and in singleness and service to God so there be no divisions among us ever. I have seen, I've seen situations where individuals will squabble over things that really they shouldn't. They shouldn't, and it is something that is very important and dire to us to make sure that when we are when we are interacting with individuals that we do so in a manner which is pleasing in God's sight. It's very important for us to. Verse forty five and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need, and they continuing daily with all with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Singleness of heart. We have to make sure that we're abiding in that singleness and service to God, that we don't let other things in. When, we, when we're doing that, what we're doing is saying, I'm going to walk, Christ-like in this world regardless of what affects me externally. And I know sometimes that is a difficult task if we think about the things that happen to us externally, how that Satan tries to harm us. Nonetheless, God can help us through it just as Job went through it. Now, I hope that no one ever goes through what Job went through. I know that we have different kinds of problems in our life at different times. All of us do. But Job was a man that I look to and I think about how did he make that through? How did he make it through those situations? Well, it was through faith in God. That's how he made it through that. That is a pinnacle of a situation how that we can look at an individual that went through so much, so much, and still made it through it. But it was through God's help. When someone... When someone goes through problems, it could be minor in my eyes, but it could be major in someone else's life. It could be something that's affecting them significantly, yet to me, I look at it and say, well, that's not something that would really bother me that much. Well, that doesn't mean I shouldn't care just as much about what that person's going through as they care. I should. When I have a brother and sister in Christ, especially, when they're going through whatever the problems are, I should care deeply that they're significantly affected. I should care so much and that I should love them and want to help them to the extent that I can. In Proverbs chapter 6, I want to look there for just a second and read because this really highlights how that we have to be careful, we have to watch, and we have to make sure, and I want to read a specific verse to highlight that, what we're doing in our life. You know, we think about how that we are leading a life and the 
the legacy that we leave or the time that we spend and how it's affecting other people, well, we have to make sure what we're doing, again, isn't contrary to what God says. Sometimes we in the flesh desire things in our interactions that are not pleasing to God, so we have to watch that. Be careful. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked, wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. That is very important that we don't do that, that we have to be careful and watchful, not that we would compromise on sin. I'm not saying that at all. Not in the least. But some things that we have in our life or some things that we do doesn't really make any difference either way. So we want to make sure that we're in unison with our brothers and sisters in Christ always. Again, not for sin. If there's a brother and sister in Christ that's committing some sort of sin, well, there's a place and we could look into that, how that we should interact, what we should do, and what we should say to them to help bring them back into the fold so that they are not left out. And that is very important because we don't want anybody to be to miss heaven. We want everyone to make it to heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 13, it says this, and we run into people a lot dealing with this, I think. I know, well, I can say at least I do. I run into people a lot dealing with this matter, unfortunately. And it says in verse 13, beginning, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you. But Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. A lot of times people will say, well, so-and-so, and this has caused denominations to pop up. I was baptized by so-and-so, so I'm going to adopt that name. I think so-and-so is a good example, so I'm going to adopt that name. We are not authorized to do that. That causes the divisions. That causes divisions. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. If Brother Paul baptizes somebody, if I baptize somebody, if somebody, if another, there's another preacher baptized somebody, that didn't make any difference. What made a difference was Christ. It didn't matter if I did that or someone else did that. What well, mattered that they're baptized into Christ. That's what we need to focus on. That's the importance that we're walking as Christ, that we're leading a life that is pointing to Him and that we're pleasing in His sight. In Ezekiel chapter 11, I want to go over here and read for just a second. In Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 17. Therefore say this, saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the despiteful, uh, detestable things, therefore, and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them all, give them a heart of flesh, being tender-hearted toward God. That is vital. That we're in singleness of mind, and we have a tender heart toward God, that we're serving Him faithfully. A lot of times, if we have our own thoughts and opinions, and we, I'm going to turn over to Matthew chapter 23. If we have our own thoughts and opinions, if they don't align with God, then they should fall to the wayside. Because if we are, what we're doing, we're saying, you know, I have my own opinion, I'm going to follow that. Well, we're saying our opinion is more important than God, than more important than what He says. And we will, that is where, through pride and arrogance, that is where we sow division. That's where it comes from. That's where it'll start at. But Matthew chapter 23 and verse 24, Ye blind guides which strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, first that which is within... Uh, thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that thou outside of them may be clean also. What should... What is someone needing to focus on inside, our inner self? That is where all the problems come from. That's where we either speak good things or bad. That's where we either follow God or turn from Him is the inside, not the outside. The outside will come. The outside, <coughs> excuse me, the outside will be a reflection of those things that we're trying to achieve in service to God. When we're a lot of times when we're first, we first become a Christian the way that we act 
I can speak for example, the way that you act, you have to learn that, you know, this way that you've been leading your life up to this point wasn't right. The way that you're acting, the way that you act with other individuals, the way that you interact with other individuals was wrong. So you have to change. Maybe what I wore wasn't right. Maybe I had clothing that maybe they said things that I wouldn't, shouldn't have been wearing. Burn them. Get rid of them. Because we want to make sure that we're being like Christ, that we're doing things that we ought to do, not because of an outward appearance. And likewise, someone can put on an outward appearance and they can look like an individual that would be a Christian, yet inside they're not. And inside is the most important part. Because if inside there is not a heart in service to God, there is not a person who is a singleness of mind that they are not pleasing to God, no matter how much they clean up the outside, no matter how nice someone looks. In First Peter, I want to turn there and read in just a second, First Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, beginning, "...which sometime were disobedient, and once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water." The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That water, we all take baths, we all take showers. We all clean ourselves. Yet that is not the type of cleanness we're looking at here when we talk about baptism. We're talking about washing away sin. A lot of times the things that we can't see. A lot of times the things that you can't see about someone else, and a lot of times the things that they can't see about you. That's what we're talking about, a singleness of heart. We have to make sure that we're serving God faithfully in singleness of mind and heart. And 1 John, turn over just a little bit, 1 John in chapter 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and that His commandments are not grievous. You know that second part is a lot of times what people miss. People will say, you might ask someone, well, have you... Someone will say, well, I've not been a thief. I've not been a murderer. I've not done these things. And I can assure you, and you brethren know this too, that everyone has fallen short of... Everyone has fallen short of God. Everyone has committed a sin needing Christ. Yet, when we look at this, it says, His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. When we serve God, His commandments should not be grievous. It should not be a point when we look at it and say, you know, I want to serve God, but I don't like what He's saying. That would cause us to not have a singleness of heart or in mind toward God. Our desire would be to do the things of this world rather than the things which are obedient, being obedient to God if His commandments are grievous. I want to go and just read a few more verses with you this morning. And these last ones are in Psalms. I want to go over to Psalms. And it's 139. It's where I'm going to turn to. Psalms 139 and verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Try me, look through me, show me if there's any wicked way in me, because you want to be cleansed. You want to make sure that you are leading a life, not because you think that you're pleasing to God, but because you know it. Because you can see that you're following after what God says. We can all have opinions on what is right before God, but we want to make sure we're right before God. We don't want to go by opinions. We want to go by what God says. And, and this last verse I want to read is in Psalm chapter 51, and it's verse 10. Create in me, same thought, same thought as what I was reading just a second ago, but create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. There's so many times that we look at the Scriptures and we look to see what's identifiable about, identifiable about sin but it has to start. We see a, a Christian, we see someone who is starting a life that they want to lead, which would be pleasing in God's eyes. And we want to make sure, and although we read in Luke chapter 30, Luke chapter 13, verse 3, that we repent from sin, we want God as we walk in our life with Christ. We want to make sure that He reveals to us and shows us the places that we need to grow and that we need to change. We don't want to be stuck at the same, in the same way. When we first become a Christian, we don't want to be that same individual a decade later, two years later, 
30 years later because if we are, if we're the same person when we, as when we started as a Christian 30 years later, that means we're not growing. That means we didn't have that desire to serve God faithfully. And it takes that desire. It takes an individual who is willing, and God knows your heart, who is willing to turn from those things and be cleansed from those things and get rid of those things. Sometimes, sometimes people have to take things out of their house and burn them. doesn't matter how much they cost. Sometimes people have to get rid of things. Sometimes it's because a brother or sister in Christ is tempted by something and we have to make sure we get rid of it because we don't want to have that temptation waiting right there. Sometimes, maybe someone, I'll, I'll be quiet in just a second, but sometimes we are an individual where we had a temptation. Maybe in our previous life, before we were a Christian, we were an individual that had a temptation of drinking. We can't walk down the aisle in Walmart where they sell that stuff anymore because it would tempt us to reach out and take it. So we have to stay away from it. So we want to make sure we're cautious of that and we're careful of those things and we're pleasing to God so that we're growing in faith and service to Him. If there's anyone that's not a Christian, I want to read these verses and for us also as Christians to keep these in mind so that when we're talking to those that are lost in this world that we can give them these verses so that they know what to do and what to obey, not because of our opinion, but because of what God said. It says in Romans 10, 17, So the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them, and diligently seek him. Luke 13, 3, the verse I was referring to a little bit ago. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Romans 10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The latter state of that verse is terrible. The first state is very, very wonderful. My hope is that as we go throughout this life and we interact with those individuals that are lost, that they see Christ in us and that they would ask us, what do I need to, be, what do, I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to gain Christ? Thank you for your time as we come together and sing this selected song.